I hope people walk into the exhibition, A Collector's Journey, and actually think about their own journeys, their passions, their possible obsessions, the things they collect, other family members, how we end up accumulating all these mementos of various aspects of our lives, and they're not necessarily our favorite things or the painting we bought and love. It's actually an accumulation of all those things. And that's what I wanted to, that's why I thought of it as an accidental collection. These things, there are some things that we deliberately bring into our lives and there's a lot of other things that just get accumulated through various sources into our lives. And I think what I'm most grateful for is how, because my thing has been art, other people have other, other areas, how artists enrich our lives with such generosity and with such imagination. Well, I suppose my biggest traveling adventure was when um, a friend John Rendell and I went to London in 1969 and in the Harrod Zoo as a Christmas attraction were two lion cubs. And although we were traveling and didn't have a lot of money and he was expensive, we fell in love with Christian the lion and lived with him in London for about six or nine months as he grew very rapidly. So Bill Travers negotiated for George Adamson to be allotted some land in northeast Kenya for Christian to be rehabilitated back into a, a natural life after seven generations in Europe. So we took him out there and then we came back a year later. That was filmed and we got a fabulous response from him and our reunion became a huge hit on YouTube, over 100 million viewers. And we went back the next year, and then the following year, he was never seen since 1973. That was an extraordinary adventure in its own way. But it was marvellous being in Africa, and I think it did have a very big effect on me. I loved the art. I loved the Maasai necklaces, and then I became, I was very interested in the people. And I think by living in London and Europe and going to such good art museums and being surrounded by it and always having friends of artists, I think all these factors did have an effect on me. Uh, when I first returned to Australia in the early 1970s, it was a very exciting time because Gough Whitlam was in power and in the Strand Arcade, people like Jenny Key had opened Flamingo Park and they had very exciting fashion parades. Peter Tully's jewellery and William Yang photographed it. It was an exciting time. I don't think it was just because we were, we were young. And then I realised that a lot of these artists, friends of mine, were very unrepresented um, by the galleries at the time. So I did open my first gallery, Ace's Art Shop, and I loved doing it. And in fact, I thought, well, look, this is my milieu, artists and art, why don't I try and make a career out of it? With no art background, I might, might say. In 1983, I thought I'd stage an exhibition in Sydney, um, which I did at The Rocks, um, called Living in the Pacific, because there was a lot of very good Pacific art in Sydney. People thought I'd travelled the Pacific. I wish, I still haven't really done it. And it was so colourful, so big, the billums, the woven masks, the carvings. And it was the first time I'd actually sourced Aboriginal art for myself and actually led into my, my career in, in Aboriginal art. So that was a key show because it was a change of direction for me. And it was designed to try and make us think that we actually do live in the Pacific. I realised that the Aboriginal story was the most interesting story about Australia and that Aboriginal art was the most original art we were producing. And that certainly is really what the rest of the world have been interested in. The Hogarth Galleries was the first commercial art gallery of Aboriginal art. 
and they've always loved Bach paintings. And I was irresistibly drawn to them, but I can't pretend th that it was... I found them initially a little difficult, but then I got my eye in on them. And I think people do have trouble with them even today. They are quite foreign. I love the big totemic animals when you see Millet Boom as crocodile. It's so like suddenly when you see it on television, a crocodile, you realize how marvelously he painted it. And of course, with their fine infill, the rock, it is designed to activate the image with all the power of a totem of his, him and his clan. So I collected Bach paintings rather obsessively. Although I love nearly all Aboriginal art, I was especially interested in the generation that emerged in the 1980s that were an extraordinary generation and probably the first to uh, benefit from going to art school, having the opportunity to go, and the absolute savviness to make the most of it. And they had a lot to say, and they were attractive and lively. So I just loved them. But they're an incredible generation of writers and artists and curators. Hetty Perkins, Brenda Croft, John Mundine, Tracy Moffat, Michael Riley, an extraordinary generation. A lot of them really are, are among the best artists in Australia and in fact really like to be referred to as Australian artists because while their Aboriginality underpins a lot of the work they do. They are artists in the world at large and like to be seen in that way. Travel is a passion. It was India for me, which I actually went to rather late. I don't lie on beaches necessarily, so I started to look for Indian tribal art and very luckily met Janga Singh Shyam and he became India's premier Indian tribal artist, in fact, so that was just lucky. In probably about 1998, um, a curator at the Museum of Sydney um, asked me to propose an exhibition at the Museum of Sydney, and I did think they really wanted an exhibition of the Martin the, the artists that, were, that I'd worked with, like Martin Shabba, Peter Tully, or William Yang. But in fact, over the weekend, I thought, um, I didn't really know my family history, but I did know Mum being descended from Governor King and Dad was descended from Governor Burke. And so both families had lived on the site. It was first government house. The Museum of Sydney had been a very imaginative and quite contentious museum in a way uh, over the, the foundations of first government house. And I thought, I have to respond to that. Mind you, several people in the Museum of Sydney did not like that. The master narrative, like my sort of background was, was exactly what the Museum of Sydney was trying to get away from because, of course, the master narrative has dominated the telling of history. So some of them didn't really like me producing this master narrative and just a million colonial relations. But mind you, I think I could tell quite a good story about it because there was such marvellous material from early paintings to prints to journals to family Bibles. And, you know, by the time you go back a few generations, we've all got so many different branches of our family. So that was the story I wanted to tell. One of the most beautiful things about becoming friends with people like Tracy Moffat and Michael Riley and Hetty Perkins was their interest in my own colonial family. My non-Indigenous friends were not interested and I'd never really told them about it. Um, and in fact, we grew up being quite shy about it, that it would really alienate, but it didn't really make you any friends, especially growing up in suburban Newcastle. And it was my Aboriginal friends with that Aboriginal heightened appreciation of how important family was and family history. Although in a lot of ways we represented the families that had dispossessed them, and we did, it was they wanted to hear my story and were interested and generous and 
I don't quite know the word, but they drew that story out of me. And without their interest, I probably would never have told my story at the Museum of Sydney. I think when you live with the things you've collected, everything is like a piece of the puzzle of who you are. Everything of a decorative nature carries so many memories um, of friends, of family, or where, where you bought it, that it, um, they are, they're maps of our lives, and you can get as much enjoyment out of the simplest thing as, uh, as out of the most expensive, expensive item. That's what's extraordinary. It's just all the memories th that you, you bring to that particular item.